Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the uh, afternoon session in the Michael Fowler Centre Auditorium. i um, going to introduce you now to the next session with Eric Day, uh, who plays around, hacks a bit on drizzle. Uh, over to you, Eric. Thank you. Um, so my name's Eric Day. I've been hacking mostly on Drizzle and Gearman for the past year. Um, I was with Sun, but now out of Sun. Um, <laughs> no further comment there. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Gearman today, um, and I'll have a, you know, it's mostly an introductory session. Um, doesn't dive down too deep. So the topic was map reducing queues for everyone. Um, I'm going to show you how, you know, first of all, Gearman is a distributed processing system. And using that, you can build other distributed architectures, such as MapReduce and Queues, at least until Google starts enforcing their patent. They just was announced two days ago on MapReduce. Um, so in order to get MapReduce and Queues, um, more specifically, asynchronous queues, uh, within Gearman, it started at LiveJournal.com, the Danga folks who created LiveJournal, they had this problem of image processing. In this case, they were actually using Perl, but they were doing all their image processing inside their Apache processes, or you know, a, a forked version of, of the Perl. And the problem with this is you end up having your frontline Apache machines doing all the image processing, which if you're taking a large image and creating a thumbnail, it can be quite expensive. So you end up having your frontline Apache machines doing a lot of you know, image processing work when they should be um, you know, using that power to serve more requests. So what they did is design Gearman to push this image processing work off to another cluster of computers, dedicated um, essentially an image processing farm. And they use Gearman in the middle to say, you know, here's some image stored over in this file system here, convert it for me and tell me when it's done. And you can either do this synchronously or asynchronously. So you can submit a job, wait for it, or submit a job and just go off and do something else. So when someone reloads right away, you get the you know, images processing, please come back in five seconds. So this is the architecture that we're moving towards. And a few other people picked it up, like Dig. And this is a nice quote that I like from Joe Stump. The way I like to think of Gearman is a massively distributed, massively fault tolerant fork mechanism. So I'm gonna go over the history, um, a little bit the basics go back to the image processing example, and then get more specifically into MapReduce examples and queuing examples. So like I said, it started at Danga with Brad Fitzpatrick and the, the team of guys working there. And it's sort of lumped into other projects like MogulFS and MemcacheD and PerlBal, which I'm sure some of you have heard of. And Gearman, the name, is an anagram for manager because Gearman really doesn't do anything that useful itself. It sits in the middle just you know, taking work to be done and dishing it off to someone else to do it, but it doesn't actually do any of the real work itself, like a manager. And like I said, Dig picked it up. Um, they've been using it for quite a while. They developed the, the pure PHP um, client and worker extensions for it. And then of course, Yahoo picked it up for my blog log, their, their blogging service, and they have a pretty robust architecture built on top of Gearman, and of course, LiveJournal six apart and other um, companies have been picking up more recently with the with the new developments, which include a complete rewrite in C for the job server, which I'll get to in a little bit more. And we have a lot more language bindings, um, especially um, some of the Python stuff. Monty down in front, he's helped a lot with with that, and doing some of the other Swig wrappers on top of the C libraries to give us C based extensions, not just you know the language. Um, like the Perl, pure Perl implementation and the pure PHP implementations. Uh, I also developed a command line tool, and while doing the, the C server, I added um, multi-threading support so we can process a lot more jobs. And um, we've benchmarked it on a eight core machine up to 50,000 jobs a second. And developed persistent queues, so when you're, when you're dealing especially with background jobs, saying like, hey, go do this and you go away, you know, if your server crashes, you don't want that to, you know, lose all the jobs that was sitting in it. So you can use your persistent queue to store it in things like SQLite or MySQL or Drizzle or Tokyo Cabinet. And uh, experimentally, there's some pluggable protocol stuff in there to give it an HTTP interface. And we're also looking at, at other protocols to extend in there. 
So some of the main features of Gearman are obviously it's open source. All the C stuff is BSC licensed, so you can use it anywhere you like. Um, and there's you know all the various clients that plug into it are you know ranging from PHP license for the obvious PHP stuff. And I think the original Perl implementation is in um, is GPL. So it's really simple. Um, if you look at the line protocol, it adds very little overhead on top of your application. It's multi-language, so you can speak everything from a MySQL user-defined function, you know, starting Gearman jobs directly from your SQL, or say inside of PHP, or from a shell script. Um, and equally on the worker side, you can do a lot of work on the back end in any language that's you know suitable for your application. Which is nice because maybe your front end guys all use PHP, but your back end guys really like using Python, and Gearman can be that middle layer to to transfer work in between them. There's a like I mentioned in the beginning, Gearman gives you a distributed application model, which you can build MapReduce or asynchronous queues or really any ad hoc model that you want, so you're not restricted to a single type of development environment or single type of model. It's embeddable, meaning that you can take existing applications, like your existing web page, and easily just plug in a few lines of um, the Gearman API code to be able to produce um, or be able to extend you know, existing applications without having to rewrite it into this other framework. It just plugs in really nicely wherever you, wherever you see that would be most useful. And unlike some other distributed systems, there's no single point of failure, which is kind of an obvious you know, um, feature in distributed systems. Um, I also want to mention really quickly, there's going to be some code examples. And if you are online, you can go to the, the gearman.org website. And under presentations, I've, I've linked the slides already. So you can pull the slides down um, to look at the code if you know they're not as readable up here. So the basics of Gearman, it's a TCP IP protocol. You have three main components, a client, a worker, and a server. A client is responsible for submitting jobs that need to be done. A worker sits on the back end, say, in that image processing farm, pulling jobs, actually doing the work that needs to be done, possibly responding to them, um, to the original client. And then the job server sits in the middle and sort of you know, maps clients to workers and manages jobs. So say if you submit a job and the worker starts working on it, then it dies. It knows enough that, hey, this worker disconnected. I'm going to restart it um, on another worker. So you have some fault tolerance. So the job server basically manage, uh, manages all those jobs that are going in between. Now, if you look at your typical application stack with Gearman, you only need to write the, you know, the top and the bottom, the blue parts. All the, you know, the socket communication, all the, you know, all the distributed, you know, um, arrangements and, and processing, Gearman takes care of for you. So you only have to write, you know, just a few lines of code to, to get started with your first project. And looking at a typical, well, very small Gearman cluster, it would work something like this. Um, and this points out where the, where you don't have a single point of failure, and that you can have a job server, or you can have multiple job servers. And workers connect to all of them. So no matter where the work gets submitted to, there's a worker um, will be able to pull it from either one. And your client will be able to submit to any job server that it sees available. And you don't necessarily have to have the workers fully connected on the bottom here. But you know, typical small clusters, you just want to you know, make sure you have at least two job servers and you know, all your workers can pull from those job servers to do that work. So, Here's the first little code example, and this is the hello world of Gearman. And this is in PHP, but if you want to use Perl or Python or anything else, it's going to be pretty much identical minus the obvious syntax changes. Um, what you do is create a Gearman client object. You add a server, and this can be a server list. So if you have five job servers, you have a common separated list of servers on there. And you, go, you say um, a method on the client, do the function reverse. And the arguments for that are hello world. In this case, we're passing a string, but that hello world argument can be any binary chunk of data up to four gigabytes. I don't suggest actually pushing four gigabytes through a typical job server, but it is possible. That's the protocol limitation. So you can actually serialize anything, say, you know, take a front end web request, serialize it into JSON or XML, sh ship that through if it's more than just a simple string. You can push, you know, like I said, binary data or anything else that you know, your application needs. On the back end, with a worker, you create the same um, pretty much setup as the client with creating a worker object, adding the same set of servers, adding a function 
And this is essentially registering with the job server saying like, hey, I can do the function reverse. So when I'm in my basically infinite loop waiting for jobs to be done, tell me when I get a, you know, a job that can be done, send it to me. And what will happen is within the worker code, the callback, which is a second argument, gets called with that job that was sent. So in this case, every time a reverse job is sent down to the worker, it picks it up, runs string rev on it, and returns it. And rather than just showing that, I was going to show you actually how, you know, using that exact code, how simple this really is. Once you have things in, installed, which I think in, um, in uh, Ubuntu now, there's pretty recent versions of, of Gearman-D. I think it's Gearman job server package. Um, you can just app get install all the, the tools that I'm showing you right now. Um, so Gearman-D is the name of the job server. And I'm starting it with uh, verbose flags on so we can see what's going on here. And in another window, I'm going to start up the worker, the reverse worker, which we just saw the code for. And that's now running. And a worker essentially runs as a small daemon just waiting for jobs coming in. And if we switch back to the job server, we can say, hey, accepted connection. And in this, this case, it's actually the worker. So we know that connected in. Now in another window, I'm going to run the client with hello world. And we can see it submitted a job. Um, the worker performed the work, and we got the result back. And if we go back to the job server, we can say, hey, a new connection came in. During, while it was connected, it submitted the job. Some things went on with the worker to have the worker do that job. It brought it back, and now it's done. So any questions so far on the, the basics of how Yeah, so the worker, you have to explicitly register anything that you want done. If you submit a job to a function that isn't registered, it will, it will essentially sit there and block forever. So, you know, going back to, to this case, so the job server is still running, but I'll kill the worker here, so the worker is no longer running. And I'll submit the client, and the client's sitting here blocking because it's waiting for work to be done. And the reason why it blocks and just doesn't error out um, automatically is this avoids some race conditions when you're, you know, starting up a cluster of like, oh, my worker isn't started yet, but I don't want all my clients to fail because, you know, half a second later they may be ready. So we can see as soon as we start up a worker, it immediately flushes the queue to be done, and when we switch back, it was already completed. Yeah. What? What happens in the case where your job submitted async rather than synchronously? Um, in that case, uh, it, what happens is the, the job will immediately, from the worker perspective, it actually looks ex exactly the same. It doesn't know if it's doing it synchronously or asynchronously. But the client, as soon as it submits the job, it will just go away, and it'll be sitting in the queue in the job server, but the client can go off and do whatever else. It's not, not attached. And sort of just to demonstrate that, I mentioned there was a command line tool, which I'll show a little bit more later. Um, so you can just use gearman as the name of the command line tool, dash f as a function to run, in this case reverse, and then I'll just put hello world here. And we can see we get back the same hello world reverse. And this is just running it from the shell. So any anything that we either basically pipe into standard input or any arguments past the normal argument list is consider the payload for the job to be done. But if we add a dash B option, which says background job, it just went away. We don't, we don't block waiting for any response. So even if a worker isn't registered yet, it will still submit it, go away, and then when a worker comes in, it'll flush the queue, but the client has no idea that that happened. There are ways to check on background jobs to see if they've been done. Um, you get a unique ID back, essentially, so you can go and say, hey, is this job done yet? But um, yeah, that's, that's basically what happens, you know, with the background job. So getting back to the distributed processing example, um, like I said, you have your Apache machines, you know, doing all the image processing for you. Insert Gearman so you can install a, a image resizing cluster essentially in the back end. And with a PHP worker with this, it looks pretty much the same as that Hello World example, except the resize instead of a reverse function, we register a callback that's a resize function. 
And in this case, I'm using the image magic library within PHP. And you can just say, read the image blob, do some workload, um, scale the image, and then just return it. And this is showing that you can actually just use binary data for this. So with the same job server running, I'm going to run that resize worker right here. And then using the command line tool, I'll run a job for resize. And I'll input a large JPEG. And so anything on standard input ends up going to um, essentially is the payload. And I'll write this out to a small JPEG. And it takes a second because there's, there's like a three, I think it was a three megabyte image. So there's a little bit of overhead um, to you know send that over the socket. Um, if we look, you know, four megabyte image to a 32k image, um, and the the code for that PHP worker that I um, just ran was exactly this. So this is showing how you know you can essentially create an image processing farm with a 10 line PHP script and even just using a shell tool if you if you want that. And of course, the worker and the client and the job server they can be run on one machine, which is what's going on with my laptop right now. But you could have those all on separate machines. You could have, you know, a whole cluster of machines running these resize workers and a whole cluster of front-end client machines and just have a few job servers in the middle. So it's really easy to scale this thing out. Um, this is just showing the, the command line that I ran there. So they developed it, and OpenOffice decided to change the color of my font on me. But this says, what else, if you can't see it. And after designing um, Gearman to help with some of this distributed processing, like the uh, like the image resizing, they, they thought, hey, we could actually use this for a few other things. One of them in particular is to build MapReduce or MapReduce-like systems to help process the uh, you know process the different types of data. In the case of LiveJournal, they actually use it for web pages, which I'll show in a second. But in this case, you know, in a more traditional MapReduce example, what you could do is have your worker also, you know, within that callback function for your worker, you could also have that act as a client um, and take a large payload that came in, you know, say if you got this, you know, a, a URL maybe or just a large file full of data, you know you can, you know, split this up into smaller chunks of work. And then it can sit there and distribute out, you know, say 100 more clients that need to be done. And then those workers will pick up those. So you can create these, you know, you know multi-tier architectures of Gearman servers. This allows you to do, you know, like the more traditional Hadoop or, um, you know, the, if you've read the Google MapReduce paper, you know, more modeled along those lines. Except, of course, you can do this in any language that you want. You're not restricted to Java, say, with Hadoop. Um, like I was mentioning, Danga used some of the, the, the ideas of MapReduce in a, in a much more, you know, real-time way with doing some of their web page generation. What they did is... You know, if you've ever done any web development, you know when you're inside of PHP, there is absolutely zero concurrency. So what you can do, say if you need to run three database queries, um, maybe query something out of memcached and pull something off the file system, you know, on another machine, say NFS, all those things can be expensive. And if you want to reduce your, you know, total load time, it would be nice if you could do those things concurrently. So what you can do with Gearman is to queue up, say, five jobs that need to be run, start them at the beginning of the web page, do whatever processing you can, and then just block when you need the results. So obviously, you need a low latency network for this to you know, be effective. But what you can do is essentially do you know, multiple expensive operations, you know, and your web page will hopefully load in only the, the time it takes to run that longest operation. So like I mentioned, database queries, um, expensive calculations like, you know, I need to generate an ad for this user, and I have all this context, such as their IP address, you know, where they're coming from. You know, maybe there's some list of preferences that I have within their account, and that needs to generate a, you know, some type of ad that's targeted for them. Um, obviously, we all hate these, but if you're working and you need to generate these, you want them to be fast. You don't want it to be a bottleneck. So you can create, essentially create a farm of computers that do ad placement and a farm of computers that, you know, do your, um, you know, your caching service so it, so it asks there to pull a, off a number of queries. And then, like I said, you can start sending as much back as you can and only block when you need the results coming back. Um, so startup, um, the Gearman API also has, I've only showed the, you know, the do functionality where you can run one job at a time. 
But there's another set of functions, which I'm not going to go into here because it's a little more advanced use case, but you can find plenty of examples out there. But it allows you to run concurrent queries. So you can say, add these five jobs that need to be run, and then go run them all in a blocks while all five are running concurrently. And that still only opens one TCP connection to the job server. So another example of, of you know, a MapReduce processing example, and this is a little bit more traditional, but still, you know, it's all going to be in shell script, so it's a little bit more ad hoc, is to bring, bring MapReduce processing to Apache logs. What you do is, instead of logging all your, you know, all your, you know, access logs and error logs or whatnot to your local file system, you can pipe these off to Gearman, and Gearman can pick them up and go do, you know, store them somewhere, maybe index them inside of MySQL or Drizzle, or, you know, do whatever it wants. It could actually even fan them out so you can store the log in multiple places or do real-time analysis on it. But the idea is to collect all of those Apache logs onto some other set of machines, so, you know, taking some of the disk access off of your local Apache nodes. And then when you actually want to analyze that, you don't have to go to the machine actually running Apache. You can go to the place where you store those logs. And, you know, the disk access and also the, you know, the processing time, say if you're grepping through these logs or, you know, running AW stats or some other, you know, clickstream tool on it, you know, that can happen, you know, offline the regular Apache nodes. And to do this, what we can do is, you know, simply tail dash F, the access log, pipe it into Gearman, um, the Gearman client, and basically it'll treat every line coming from that file as a new job. That's the simplest way to do it. You just run that at cron, uh, or sorry, just run that at startup. You can also do a custom log entry in your Apache config, you know, essentially doing the exact same thing, but, you know, configured in your Apache node. Or you could, you know, if you're really ambitious and you wanted more functionality, like some type of filtering or some type of, you know, pre-processing before shipping it to Gearman, you could essentially write a Gearman um, or an Apache logging module, you know, that's designed to ship things to Gearman. Then once you've actually stored all that data somewhere and you want to process it, you could do things like distributed grep. You could merge all those logs that you've sent somewhere else into, you know, a, a continuous stream for something like AW stats. Or you could build who knows what type of clickstream analysis tools on top of it. And this image here takes a look at how the entire architecture would, would turn out. Um, you can see all the nodes on the top are running Apache. And, you know, they're sending each log line to this first set of workers that are picking up data. And the nice thing about Gearman is it gives you natural load balancing. If, say, the first worker on the left here has picked up something and it's currently processing it, it's not going to ask more jobs. So when another job comes in, one of the other two workers that are available will pick up the job to be done. So you don't have to worry about one worker getting overloaded. It only does jobs when it knows it can do them. Um, and then the middle is basically a set of machines that could be storing these data nodes uh, or storing all this log data. And then you'll have pretty much a separate Gearman cluster on the bottom here for analyzing that data. And the job servers could really be the same job server, but, you know, for the purpose of the graph, I kept them separate. And then the remote clients could say, okay, across all those log storage nodes, um, grep for this particular pattern or, you know, merge all those in together and run some type of analysis tool on them. So I'm going to show you a little demo of how to do that with a, with a pre-recorded um, log file. The first thing that will be done is to go into a directory to keep a log. And I'm going to start up, this is just a command line tool, and I'm going to start up a worker. And the command line tool can act as a client or a worker. The dash W flag puts it into a worker mode. I'm going to listen for the function log. And every time an entry comes in, I'm just going to write it to a log file. So this is a worker that's now running and registered with a job server. Listening for log in anything that comes in, it just outputs it to standard output, which in this case is just the log file. And it, when you're running it in this mode, it's not able to send anything back, so there's no result coming back, which is fine if we're just collecting log data. Now. In another window, I'm going to run a client that's registering with the same log, and I'll run it in the back, basically submit these as background nodes, and also submit um, one line per job, 
which you know if you're if you're using the command line tool you'll you'll notice that there's two modes like read the entire standard input and then send that or read it one line at a time and every line that comes in so if you're doing something like tail dash f you obviously want to do it one line at a time and then I'll just pick up the latest Apache log that I have um, shove that in there and so it processed that Apache log and hopefully we will have um, 65k of log data. So I killed the worker, but now I'm going to start up another worker. And if we go back to the slides, I've essentially just created that first client that shipped the access log over, and that first worker, which is now you know collected all that, those log entries. And of course, we could have run 500 of those, or three, or however many that you want, you know, depending on the, the type of scale that you need. And we've essentially collected all our log data into a flat file um, called log now. Now next, I'm going to run another worker. And instead of just dumping you know, anything that comes into it to standard output, I'm actually going to run a shell script called loggrep.sh. And the shell script essentially does this little, this little bit on the bottom where it reads some batter from standard input, greps that pattern out of the log file, and anything that it outputs gets sent back as a result. So the, the command line tool is smart in that it, you know, it, it'll basically fork and exec another process, writes the payload out to it, and then anything that it comes back in, you know, by remapping standard in and out, it'll take that and treat that as the result set coming back. So if I go back here, and querying the same, um, querying the worker that I have running here that's going to run that, that shell script. And say if I want to ask for, um, I guess I ran. So what just happened there is the client sent a job saying, give me anything that matches the string PHP. And it went off, sent the job, the process, the worker process, forked and exec the log grep.sh. It grabbed the results from that and shipped it back to the client. Now, if you had, say, five of these, these uh, log workers running, you'd have to enumerate them saying log one, two, three, four, five, or something like that. You could do, essentially, you know, start pi piling them on like that. So let me clear that so you can see that a bit more. The shell command line tool right here, you can see you know, dash F logger one, logger two, blah, blah, blah. All that does is submits three jobs to be done, one for each of the functions, logger one, logger two, logger three, and then it aggregates all the results for you and dumps it back out to you. So you can query multiple workers at the same time. Um, so using this, you can see you can pretty easily, in a few lines of shell script, create a distributed map reduce, or um, I think there's another project out there that termed the coin bash reduce, which is kind of amusing. So obviously, I'm showing you command line tools and shell scripts, but you could do this in Python, PHP. You could integrate this in with MySQL. You know, all those client APIs are there, so you can really integrate this into whatever architecture you're already running or whatever language you're most comfortable with. Any questions on the, the MapReduce likeabilities before moving on? Um, automatic retry. So if a worker, if, if the server that hosts a worker node goes splat in the middle of a job, mm -hmm. what happens? So the job server is smart enough to, it, basically it, it keeps a persistent TCP connection to the worker. So the worker connects, pulls down a job. If that TCP connection drops before it's able to send back a result set, the job server no notices this and will say, hey, this worker died without a result. Put that job back on the queue and run it on another worker. So that's really one of the main reasons the job server exists is to provide that mapping to workers and to restart in the case of those types of failures. So the implication of that is that if you're pushing big data sets out to your workers, you want to do copy by reference rather than? Um, within the job server, everything's kept in memory. Yeah. And there, it, it, it is only copied in there once. Um, so it is actually keeping a reference. So. 
the job exists at all times while the job is active in the job server. So even if a worker is working on it, the job still exists with the payload. It doesn't actually you know, destroy it or ask for the client to resend or anything like that. It keeps it cached, essentially. So if the worker does die, it's right there to be written out to another worker again if it needs to. Oh, I think there's a mic coming. Um, if a worker dies or hangs, um, how's that looked after? Will the result code, like an, an error code, comes back? Oh, it, if so, the worker can die in a few ways. It can actually fail gracefully, saying, you know, I cannot do this this job, you know, for for whatever reason. It actually sends a result set back saying work fail, and in that case. Um, the job server can continue to retry. That's actually a configurable parameter of how many times should this job be retried. And that error can propagate back to the client. If it's like, say if you wrote it in C or there's a bug in one of the APIs and the whole thing just, you know, seg faults, then that's what happens when the, uh, the job server takes action and says, okay, I'm going to restart it because, you know, the work just completely disappeared. Similar vein, um, timeout. If you give some work to a, a worker and you expect it to take a second and it takes 10 minutes, what happens? Yep. Um, so timeouts are interesting in the workers because you really need to, to be able to do, you know, since it's running your application code, you pr and you're, if you want to be sensitive to those type of timeouts, you really need to basically do, handle that in your application. Gearman sort of takes a minimalist approach in that you know, it does, it provides you with the framework, and then, you know, if you want your code to only run in, say, one minute, just, you know, put some type of timeout mechanism within your own code. You know, Gearman can't, like, inject that type of thing into your code. But from a client perspective, we can actually have a timeout saying, do this job, and I've set a timeout for, you know, 10 seconds. So the client will return immediately saying, like, hey, the job timed out, so you can go off and do something else. You can do that down to the millisecond resolution, which is really useful if you're doing web development. Say, do this job, but if it takes more than, you know, 100 milliseconds, just stop because I'm not going to use that anyways. So, yeah. You mentioned no single point of failure. What about the job server? If um, the client can register with obviously multiple, but if you lose a job server, all the jobs in that single job server are gone. So if you're using um, the default install, which is basically everything's kept in memory, you will be, you know, basically losing any jobs that were in, currently in the queue. And this actually only applies to background jobs, because if you're a foreground job and you've submitted a job, you know if the job server goes away, you can reconnect to another job server. But for background jobs, that's when the persistent queue plugin comes into play, um, because what that does is stores it into something like Tokyo Cabinet or Drizzle or MySQL, so when the job server comes back up, it can actually rerun them. And of course, that MySQL server doesn't need to be running on the same machine as the job server. You know, you could have you know your persistent queue database over here and a job server talking to it. So if you completely you know that machine blows up and goes into flames, you can still you know point another Gammon job server at that persistent queue. Uh, here. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, Say we have about five workers and a bad job, mm -hmm. so the job dies. We have four workers, and what we're seeing right now is that that progressively keeps coming down. Is there a way to monitor, figure out how many workers are there, and if it's a bad job, you know, probably fire up. I want, yeah. say, six workers running at any point of time. So, so it's like the poison job that, you know, you, you submit a bad job, and then it kills all your workers yeah. um, and then because of nothing, a bug in your yeah. code? Yeah, there's a, there's an option in the job server. Um, or dash dash help, um, and of course that's so. There's a dash j, job retries, and that specifies the maximum number of job retries for a particular job. So if you you know submit a bad job and you say dash j three, it will at most kill three of your workers. It won't clean out you know all of them. Um, what happens when that when that case is hit? Uh, right now, the job server just simply logs it, saying like, "Hey, this this bad job killed two two of my workers, and I'm dropping the job because I don't want it to destroy my entire cluster." 
Um, as far as monitoring those workers, that's outside of the scope of the GearMan project, at least currently. Um, you know, there's a lot of monitoring and provisioning tools out there that GearMan isn't necessarily a good thing to try to build on top of. So you could use, you know, um, if you look on the, the GearMan mailing list, which I'll post here in a second, there's been a lot of discussion about what's the best way to monitor your GearMan workers. And this can be, you know, any number of other open source tools out there. So. Is there more questions? Oh. Sorry. <laughs> um, how does it scale if I have a few thousand workers? Mm -hmm. Can it deal with that? I mean, yep. Um, specifically, LiveJournal dealt with this, and they even do it in Perl, so if it's in C, it's going to be better. Well. Um, <laughs> but what happens is when a job comes in, um, the default action is to wake up all workers that are available to do that job, but obviously you have a thousand workers, and only one of them is actually going to get that job. You don't want to create that much you know, network chatter. So what you do is put a limit saying, only work, wake up three workers when a new job comes in. So that way you're not creating too much extra overhead there. So you can still scale out to a large number of workers. So, but if I've got, say, 20,000 workers, 20 servers, um, that means I'm probably maintaining at least 1,000 connections, 1,000 PCP connections per job server. Is yep. that right? Yeah, so the... The most I've pushed the job server TCP connection-wise up is probably in the 8 to 10K range. So I know it can handle that, no problem. Um, the job server uses libevent, and it uses a fixed number of threads and basically does all non-blocking asynchronous communication on each of those threads. So each, you know, say if you start up the job server with eight threads on an eight-core machine, you could have each one of those threads easily handling you know, a few thousand connections. Um, so you're really going to be hitting operating system limits. It's not like one thread per connection or anything like that. It, it shares it using non-blocking I.O. on all that. So the job server should scale really well with that many um, TCP connections. Sounds good. And sort of elaborate on that a little more, you could also start up, say, you know, if, if you're dealing with that type of scale, start up five job servers and have separate sets of workers dedicated to each job server. And obviously, that type of segregation of like these workers only connect to that job server, um, you know, that'll obviously help you scale it too. So with oh five minutes, oh wow. So I'm going to go through this really quick. Asynchronous queues. Um, if you've used any type of queuing system, uh, you know, you, you know that they kind of help you scale. In Gearman terms, this is the background task that we're talking about, where you just throw it at the job server and go away, and you don't care if it gets done, possibly. Um, this is really useful in building distributed data storage models. This is um, one of the things. Gearman is actually powering MogulFS. If you've ever used MogulFS, the, the um, distributed file system, also by the Danga guys. And you can also, of course, build other types of distributed data models on this where you can you know, just start shoving things into queues and you know, with eventual consistency, it'll sort itself out at the end of the day. Um, obviously, Gearman doesn't dive into that at all, but Gearman enables you to do that easily with this type of distributed you know, networking component taken care of. And the other side of asynchronous queues is obviously not everything requires an action. If you are developing a web page and you need to send out email notifications or do background processing or maybe you know, reprocess full text indexes, you can just you know, toss those jobs into a queue saying like, hey, send out these five emails, don't actually process and send out those five emails while I'm, you know, generating the web page to send back to the user. Just toss all that into a queue that can be, you know, run later. Um, and of course, as soon as you do asynchronous queuing, you can have workers say pull down 500 jobs to do some type of batch processing on them as well. You don't have to necessarily do them one at a time, um, so that batch processing capability can make things a lot more efficient for you. Um, Narada is a, a full-text search engine that I worked with with uh, Patrick Galbraith. Um, he put this in his book for, he actually wrote a book on Perl and PHP. Um, the PHP one's coming out soon. But in this model, the, the yellow boxes were Gearman workers. And to do this type of full-text indexing, it, it's really just you know submitting a URL, then, then there's a worker that picks that up and inserts it into the database and creates the unique record. And then there's another worker that picks that up 
and actually pulls down the web page, scans the document for more URLs, and creates this little feedback loop so you can sort of keep on indexing forever. And then that one will trigger off a worker that can recalculate your indexes. And then there's another worker to actually search all those indexes. So it's really this loosely coupled distributed system to do full text um, indexing and search. And due to time, I'm just going to skim over it. But um, it's on launchpad.net. So just launchpad.net slash Narada. And you can go and play with the code. But don't have too much time to go into the details of it. But it shows you how to do sort of a pipelined approach for distributed processing using asynchronous queues in between each one of those nodes in the pipeline. Um, and of course, when you're developing any type of new application, if it's not MapReduce or if it's not queue-driven, you know you can start thinking about more scalable architectures because you can so easily start, you know, pushing things between different nodes um, in your cluster. Um, I'm not going to ramble on too much about here, but start thinking about you know other services that can be elastic in the cloud, not just you know I have you know spin up more machines, but say spin up more types of services that could, you know, be a bunch of Gearman workers that could do more processing. Like, hey, I need more Gearman workers to do image processing or more Gearman workers to do full text index. Those could be all elastic and driven depending on, you know, load monitoring that you do. So what's next? And OpenOffice has eaten my text again. Um, basically, we're, we're looking at some more features. Uh, more protocol support, security, which will make it more appropriate to run on the cloud. Right now, there's no authentication. You can obviously run it over SSL tunnels and that sort of thing. But we're going to hopefully be adding TLS and SASL and um, possibly multi-tenancy uh, you know, options as well. Um, more language binding. So if there's a language that you don't see existing yet, just you know, send it to the email list, and someone maybe already has that. And uh, also, we want to do improve you know, statistics and monitoring with this as well. And, and that's sort of a, a separate effort that's going into the job server to, to be able to mine more data out of it so you can say, how, what's the average time for running this type of job and, and that sort of thing. So I want to definitely mention tomorrow there's a Gearman boff at 1030 um, being run by Giuseppe. And definitely attend there if you want to get more hands-on hacking um, with us. And there's a website, gearman.org. Um, there's a pretty active IRC channel. And of course, the mailing list is actually really active if you want to go on and um, we can answer your questions. And I have Gearman stickers up here, too, if you want one. So be sure to come grab one if you do. That's time. Cheers, and thank you very much, Eric. And thank a you. little gift from the organizers. Well oh, done. Thank you. <laughs>